An initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership, formed in 2007, Square One DSM exists to connect entrepreneurial needs with qualified resources and to provide guided professional and business direction. Square One DSM helps entrepreneurs maximize their successes by helping them navigate resources, strengthen knowledge, improve skills, form strategic alliances, and secure proper capitalization. To find out more about Square One DSM, visit www.squareonedsm.com. Thank you all for coming. Um, sorry about the change in, or the modification of the venue. We normally have tables, but we had so many people, we didn't have room for the tables. So we decided we'd just go for chairs and figure it out. Um, I'm Mike Caldwell. I work for the Greater Des Moines Partnership, and I run an entity called Square One DSM. And basically, it's all things entrepreneurial. Um, mentor, advise startups. Uh, we have an a, uh, in-residence uh, accelerator program for those that have got a little bit of traction. Um, I also run Plains Angels, which is an angel investor forum in the area. Uh, we have about 85 angels, about half of which are really active. And uh, beyond that, uh, involved with the Global Insurance Accelerator and a few other projects. We do these meetings monthly. Uh, it's a lunch. As, as you found out, you can have a lunch or bring your own. Mark's laughing at me. It's a lunch. It's lunchtime. Yeah, I know, Mark. It's terrible. Um, you know, come on. Um, next month, we have a couple gentlemen that are actually sitting in the back room. Raise your hands, guys. These two back here in the back room will be our guests next month. They are the Clinic Note team that just came out of the Insurance Accelerator. And I heard you guys got first revenue. Okay, so you guys. So, idea, get this, idea in January, Accelerator February. Did the product ever get released? No, no product. Okay. Design, you know, Accelerator February, design March, April, talk to customers, la, 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 la. We're on July, whatever, and these guys got revenue with no product. So they'll have a lot to talk about next month. So uh, very cool. Uh, probably still be here. We are, as you may know, the Yonkers fire a year and a half ago wiped out our residents. So we're kind of uh, living out of whatever we can find. We used to have this beautiful meeting room that held 100 people, and it was phenomenal, and now we're struggling with our facilities. So my apologies about the facilities, but we'll just make do. Um, so let's see, uh, my guest. I've met Rebecca when she came back to Des Moines, and we'll get back to that a little bit, but you are from Des Moines yeah. originally, grew up here, and you left at the age of 18, literally on that birth date? Literally the week I turned 18, yeah. Yeah. And, and, ticket. And so <laughs> let's just start with where the hell did you go on your 18th birthday? <laughs> well, I... Decided to venture out to Los Angeles for the fashion industry. I was a student at Central Campus in Des Moines. I don't know if you guys have heard of that program where I discovered fashion. Um, a lot of people affiliate fashion with design. I was on the business side of things, so I was a product developer, so I worked with the design team out of college. So I attended the Fashion Institute, FIDM, and upon graduation, I was employed by BF Corporations, with, which owns a lot of larger companies like Action Sports, like the North Face, Jan Sport, a, a lot of those uh, are owned by VF Corporation. My first job, I was a specifications technician, which is working a lot with the pattern makers in China and the designers. So making sure that the clothing was arriving to the United States on time, that we, our minimums were met, and that everything was up to par. Um, Moving forward, I'll kind of talk about my background because I have a little bit of a unique background. I did the production as well as some of the design for both small and large companies. So I got to kind of get a feel for both trend forecasting and also product development. So I, um, in the last 10 years that I was in the industry of um, the fashion industry in Los Angeles, I held roles um, such as senior buyer, lead designer, product developer, te specifications technician. So a, a lot of it kind of came full circle. So in the, when I was a buyer, um, I was on a trip to Chicago doing trend forecasting for our Midwest market. And I decided to extend my stay to Des Moines. And I met with some friends from high school. And they were dressed really cute. And I said, well, where do you guys shop in Des Moines? I'm just, just out of curiosity, how far has the community come because I know it's constantly evolving and growing but how's the shopping 
and they all told me that they shop online. And so that essentially started my wheel spinning as far as the entrepreneurial side of it. So I started thinking, well, I've created successful startup companies. I've done website, I've done distribution for the website. I've gone to China and Guangzhou to the factories to source product, to meet with the factories. So I feel like maybe I can apply this to my real life. So I went back to the drawing board Googled how to be a business owner, learned it. <laughs> the answer is in help. Google, right? <laughs> just Google exactly. it. <laughs> I literally just Googled it. And I was at this time an event coordinator um, for the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, which is funny because they had me come back as an alumni and speak to the students about my broad experience in the fashion industry and then they ended up offering me a job and I thought that that would also enhance my resume you know full circle to be in the industry so I did the event coordinating um, and while I was working 60 hours a week for the Fashion Institute on the weekends I was going to the library in Silver Lake in Los Angeles and looking up business plans and market research and really putting together everything that I needed to create a successful brick and mortar store. Um, I would use, utilize all of the free resources and I would go to workshops and everything um, in Los Angeles to help you know, broaden my horizons as to being a small business owner. Um, one weekend I was looking into market research for Des Moines and kind of weighing out do I want to stay in LA and open a boutique or do I want to move back to the Midwest and open a boutique. Um, and upon that market research, knowing that the market wasn't saturated with boutiques because there was no competition, I decided to really heavily start implementing my plans to move to the Midwest. And one weekend I was working on the business plan and um, AP Lofts, I don't know if you guys have heard of that, downtown that's owned by the Nat Properties, was doing a contest for a business pitch. Um, you could win four months free live and workspace in their new lofts, which was a genius idea from their marketing team because it, it enabled them to get a lot of press. Um, from Los Angeles too. So I emailed them and said, I live in LA, can I pitch a business remotely? And they said, yes, put a YouTube video up and if you get enough votes, then we'll bring you in to the final <laughs> pitch. So did all your friends help get you votes? Yes, yeah, and it okay. was the first time that I ever, I was nervous because I hadn't told anybody, you know, and I, I'd been away from Iowa for almost 10 years. So I've lost touch with a lot of people, but now I'm asking for help, so. Um, Long story short, I was a finalist and I booked a ticket out in February in 2010, I think 2011, maybe yeah. 2011. And um, the other people that pitched ideas were amazing. And then they did a like American Idol text the final and I stood up with the three finals and then they announced me the winner and I was like, uh uh-oh. <laughs> like, like, now what do you do? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, this was really fun. My adrenaline's going, but now, like, shit's gotten real, and now I might have to actually move back. So my the plane ride back to L.A. was really like a solemn, you know, just like discovery phase. Like, am I really going to do this? Really, what can I do? I have my business plan. I have, I know in writing I could do this, but realistically, can I do this? Um, and the space that I was working with was tiny. It was less than 300 square it feet. It was tiny. It was tiny. <laughs> and I lived above it. So I, when I did the walkthrough at the space, I'm like, okay, this is not, it's not realistic. I can't do it. All odds are against me. I fly back out there to LA. I look at the cost of product, fixtures, you know, signage, everything that goes into a physical store and actually offering tangible items cash registers, you know, every, I mean, there's just so much. I have to get insurance on employees. I have to hire employees. Lights and, you know, utility bills and everything like that. How much do I need to make and sell in order to make rent? How much do I need, you know, to sell in order to, to buy product? <laughs> and then with that being said, you have to take in consideration the space is th less than 300 square feet. Are people really going to take me serious? You know? And you weren't exactly in the center of no, the universe. No, it's off the you path <laughs> in an apartment building. I had to go looking for this <laughs> yeah, place. Yeah. And then you walk in and you're, people are like, is this like real? And it's like, yes, <laughs> let me show you. <laughs> um, so really being, um, believing in yourself came 
is what I could say is number one. And not taking no for an answer because all odds were against me. On that plane ride back to LA, I'm thinking, I have a great job. I, I worked my butt off in some weird jobs and that didn't pay well in the fashion industry. And now I finally have a stable job. I can make rent and I'm really happy. I love my friends. Do I really want to do it? So sometimes you're your own worst enemy too because you're throwing ideas in and then you're just throwing ideas back at each other. And I went to banks. I could not get a loan. Um, I had a amazing, amazing, what I would like to say, um, I had an amazing business plan. And I had work for, I had help from the state to get approved for loans. And I kept getting declined, declined, declined. Banks kept saying, come back in three years when you're open. Well, how am I going to be open if you don't get me? <laughs> kind of like when your your first job, you want that job so bad, but the, inter the people are saying, well, you're not, you don't have enough you know, experience, just come back. Well, give me experience and then I will make it happen. So, and my parents kept that live here in Iowa kept saying, don't come back to Iowa, the economy's not good. Everyone kept saying, it's it's a great idea, but just stay in LA, kind of. You're doing, you're doing stay great. Stay away, yeah, don't you're come doing back. Great. Whatever you're doing, just do that. And then my dad, so I, I, I just couldn't come up with the funding and then my dad called me one day and he said, I am going to take a loan against my truck and my work truck and you can have $20,000 and you have to start paying me back right now. And he had drafted out a repayment loan and everything. So I call it a private loan. It was not luxurious and it wasn't from an angel investor, but I started my business with $20,000. And if you think about moving back to LA, from LA here, getting product fixtures, rent to forecast six months in advance, that is just not realistic. <laughs> but you so, did it. I'm in the process of doing it, yeah, but yeah, I don't want don't. to glamorize it because no. it is hand over fist, everything back into the business. It's not glamorous. People think that, especially when you think of shopping and retail, oh, she must like to shop and that's why she has a business. No, not at all. And a lot of women come into my store and uh, try and ask me, how can I start a business? I love to shop. Well, that you're going to be your own worst enemy because you're going to be shopping for yourself instead of your market. So, and I don't want to jump into that too much, but that was kind of the background of the how I started. Yeah. I don't know well, you know, it's funny because people, this is common. I was talking to somebody else that I'll get somebody coming to me and say, I, I want to start a restaurant. And I'll say, great. How many years have you worked in the restaurant exactly. industry? And it's, well, I never have. It's like, okay, you need to go work in a restaurant for a while because if you ever want to know what retail is like, go in the back room. Okay, just go into a retail store and say, can I look in your back room? Because that's retail. Exactly. The front is a fantasy that people create. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. But than it's myself. the back room where stuff stacked the ceilings, and exactly. there's unfortunately things laying on the floor that shouldn't be on the floor, and things get dirty, and you have yeah. to have them cleaned, and and the people on break leave their bad food laying around and rot, and all Absolutely. those things and that happen in the back. Somebody retail. recently just said <laughs> in the technology or for website, as I'm continuing my expansion, he said, "Well, do you have a manager at your stores?" "Yeah, I, I'm. Lo I'm kind of looking for one." And he goes, "Well, I know someone. She's a fashion blogger, and she's." Real, she loves to shop and everything, and I'm thinking, give me someone that wants to roll up their sleeves, that wants to lift boxes, because at the end of the day, that's really real life, is it's not glamorous. You hire people to do that, like the sales associates, but the managers, at the end of the day, if there's a fire, if there's a problem, if someone doesn't show up, you're responsible. And I have a really hard time being able to translate that to actually say that to my managers because I'm really go with the flow, I'm non-confrontational, but that's another aspect of the business is Hiring now that people. you are a business owner and you understand the business side of things, now you have to understand the front end side of things yeah. and making your business a success and pleasing customers and not pissing people off and retention, employee retention is hard, competing with Wells Fargo and the, the flip side of having a great economy in Des Moines is it's there's jobs. So in LA, people needed jobs. They'd work their butts off because they know they'd get replaced. It's a big city. It's cutthroat. Everybody's there for the same reason. Moving back here, I was flabbergasted by the fact that there is not that need and demand for to, to work your butt off because you're going to get replaced. They right. know they can go to Wells Fargo or have a job, you know. So I've had a terrible time with the retaining of great staff because now you have to compete with Gap and the major corporations offering 401k and insurance and that for small businesses is a nightmare. <laughs> so just because you haven't had enough of those, you tell us, so today, just real quickly, you have two stores. Yes. You're in Ankeny and Prairie Trails. Correct. And you are in West Glen? Correct. So I try and market to uh, the 18 to 35 women um, and according to my business plan. 
realistically, we have a lot of young working professionals and young moms that trust uh, our expertise because everything at the end of the day is coming from LA. I try and source product that is made in the USA, um, like the shirt I'm wearing now, and I try and keep things at a very disposable price point. So no matter where the economy is five years from now, there's always going to be uh, that kind of gray area of the $30 to $40 price point where people understand that. It's still disposable. You don't have to lose sleep because you're buying a $300 dress. But at the end of the day, you have to move a lot of product in order to pay rent. And where I rent from is the Prairie Trail in Ankeny, if anybody knows that. The and most West expensive retail. It's the most prestigious shopping areas, but I like to live on the edge and I don't like to sleep and I like to <laughs> really market me. Um, yeah, I, I can attest she does not sleep because you work 16 hours a day, yeah, literally. Yeah, I do. Because my mind, when you're passionate about something and you have a vision, you can't sleep. And people are, I'm always at the store, I'm, I'm kind of floating behind the scenes making things happen, thinking about what I'm going to do next. People are like, aren't you stressed out? How do you like do all of this? And yes, it is. But at the same time, when you love it and it comes naturally, it just... You get so excited that you don't want to sleep. You want to continue to keep going with that momentum. Now, something you said to me, and you've said this a couple times recently, that I think is kind of interesting. She's made the comment, my biggest challenge is keeping up with demand. Yeah. And so based on that, and that's one of the reasons I wanted you to have come in and talk today, especially, because um, you have a background in distribution centers. You understand how a distribution center works. And again, it's one of those things that behind the scenes, they're not quite as pretty as people want to think they are. Uh, but you're opening. Correct. So I'm going online and expanding to the online sector. So um, based on the demand, we ship out a lot from our Facebook page um, internationally and you know nationally. Um, so th it's kind of like the supply and demand theory. I'm not right now, knock on wood, trying to play catch up with stocking things so that they sell. I'm playing catch up with keeping up with the demand for the product in the store. So I thought, well, we're continuing to run out of product in the store. Why not open online, get a warehouse, and stock all of the product there and just allocate it to the stores? So I'm kind of doing two different things right now. I'm working on a website, but I'm also doing a distribution center for both stores. So all of the product will start to go into the warehouse, reallocate it to the stores, and the website portion of the warehouse, and then the back end of things the photography, in-house coding, um, web development team, um, design, receiving, and everything like that. With a where, when you exceed, you know, a certain amount of quantities and expand, you also receive a lot more unhappy customers. They want to return merchandise. So being able to foresee always the things that could go wrong in the business is where I'm at. You know, I there's another person that I mentor that has gotten into retail. And the person's comment was, when I got into this, I had no idea I'd spend four to five hours a day inside of a spreadsheet. <laughs> and to your point about, I love fashion. Um, you know, there's an old saying, don't make your hobby your business. Yeah. If it's something you love, please don't ruin it by doing yeah. it for a living. Uh, no, seriously. I mean, it's, uh, I love cars. But while I was in the car business, my family business is the car business, I learned to hate cars because it was moving iron. That's what they call it. You just got to move iron, you know. Burn taillights, move iron. Absolutely. And, and so your love for it goes away. And I think it's interesting because, again, your background, even though you've been in the front end of fashion, you've also been in the back end and you understood the complexities that are exactly. involved in and distribution. I love the business side. So working in the industry full circle was, I think, really to my advantage. Usually when you work in the industry, you are a fashion designer for your entire career. Well, I designed, I did product development, and which is the, you know, developing the product that you're wearing now. Everything is mathematical. Everything has an equation to it. The button placement, the fiber content of your items. So, you know, where you're, where you're sourcing it. And it comes down to cost at the end of the day. Who, what factory is going to cost it out for you at a cheaper rate, at a faster uh, rate, and at a better quality? Right. So, really, when I started buying, the psychological aspect of the buying industry trend forecasting but also identifying with each unique market so no matter what line of business you're in you're catering to a niche market so you have to understand that market and you have to cater to it if you start chasing multiple markets you're going to fail it's just like I'm selling women's clothing but if Forbes magazine told me that 
koala gear is in and I start carrying koala gear. Yeah. I like my... <laughs> well, it's like the person that comes and says, can you get me one of these? I, I mean, I've always... I'm a believer in the idea of you market to who you want, you sell to whoever wants to buy. And stick to that. But market. if you have a 70-year-old lady that loves your clothes and buys them, that doesn't mean you're going to start marketing to 70-year-old ladies. Exactly. Lady. Um, exactly. Yeah. And so not chasing the market and understanding it. And that business side of things is really what I'm addicted to is... And there's a lot of spreadsheets involved and analysis, especially when you go on the website. Who's your demographic? What time of day are people shopping the right. most? And then you start, and then marketing is a whole different ball game. So then you have to start marketing. And, and, you, have then, this, and you have this little competitor called Amazon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? That yeah, just the, the just launched monster. Prime Day, yeah. which I think everybody, so even in the room not heard about Prime Day? It's nuts, right? They're trying to take a, put a second Christmas in place. I so love Amazon, I don't want to get off track, no. but I think with the what they're doing too with shipping, because now they're, they're starting to te beta test in San Francisco, um, e like UPS trucks and everything. So they bought a bunch of trucks and now what they're doing is cornering UPS and FedEx and saying, your rates are so high. We're going to, we, they do so much shipping in general, they're going to start shipping now and it forces them to bring their rates down. And yeah. that's why my price point is realistic because I'm not inflating it. People get it, it's that instant gratification. And I really love companies that are honest and really are there for the consumers. Right. And Amazon is, I keep them in business a lot, yeah, but no I, I absolutely love them. A lot them. of us do. Yeah. Tell us a little more about, because I didn't know about this when I met you when you got here. I met you right after you got here. In fact, you called me before you even got here. Really? I remember, yeah, you called me up. Really? Because you were getting, it was by the time you decided to come. Okay. Yeah, so you're looking to network in the community. Perfect. Well, Good for you. something, right? <laughs> I, must, I must have registered well on Google because you found me on Google. Yeah. Um, somebody other day said I couldn't find anything for entrepreneurs on Des Moines. I'm like, really? Oh, wow. How to start uh, a business? Google. But talk about, talk about, yeah, I can't spell Google. Um, <laughs> How to spell Google. Yeah. What is the LA fashion scene? Tell us, the rest of us, because you, you're not talking about the multi-thousand dollar gowns and suits and all this cool stuff. You're talking about another part of the LA fashion scene. So for those of us who don't know what that is, give us kind of a two minute overview of what that scene is. So I essentially just placed myself, I think naturally everything happened in time in my favor um, because I just happened to get a buying job from a former boss that I worked with years ago when I first started in the industry. And, and that's one thing that I wanted to touch on. Whatever place you are in your career, networking and who you know now, whether you like people or not, smile and deal with them because chances are you might see, run into them in the future. And I learned that lesson so many times in the industry, especially in LA. The fashion industry in LA is huge, but at the end of the day, it's really small because you're gonna constantly run into people. Um, a former boss of mine that I did just a, a freelance job for a major fashion production um, they really liked my work ethic and there was a buying position opening and they knew I did product development which is completely opposite but she said that she thought I'd excel so she got me directly in with uh, interview and I got the job um, for the buyer and I came into that in probably 2006 or 2007 when the fashion industry in LA started shifting gears a little bit um, when the economy started going down around 2005, a lot of the boutiques were buying from high-end uh, showrooms, which they're still there, but they've really kind of started competing more and kind of losing their glamour um, due to the fact of the downfall. Um, so these price points were more, like I say, disposable, more affordable, and their manufacturers started doing a lot of um, private label. So long story short, a lot of places like and Taylor um, to even designers like Tory Burch are going through the same manufacturers that I am. So I'm going through the high-end manufacturers, but because they're employing designers of their own, the fraction of their cost is so much lower and their markup rate is so much higher and their margins are so much greater. So they would sell small quantities to buyers like me. Okay. So essentially the shirt that I'm wearing for my store that was under $40 is from the same manufacturer that manufactured a Tory Burch $300 silk shirt. Um, is the quality the same? Not exactly, but it's close enough. Um, so I came into that market as a buyer in LA and then I created really great relationships with my vendors. And so when I started my own store, right before I left LA, I was going to my vendors and saying, if I do this myself, if I start buying smaller quantities, can you honor the price that you're selling to me now? Yes, I can. Perfect, it's 
you know, hand in hand, aligning perfectly for me. So I want to say, based on my special relationships with my vendors, I had a, a little bit of an edge kind of sure. coming to the Des Moines community. But that, at the end of the day, gave my consumers in Des Moines the upper edge. Well, and I think that's an important point for anybody. It's just saying, I'm just going to go start this business. If I walked in off that street, no matter how much money I had, if they didn't know me, one, they're exactly. probably not going to take the meeting, and two, they're going to raise the cost. They're going to yeah. take me off. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have no terms. I'm going to yeah. pay in advance. Exactly. I'm going to, and it's going to be, it's going to take years to build those relationships. Exactly, so. and that's why I, I mean, I just got back from LA Sunday. Um, I, I try and go there every month, every other month to show face to my vendors to really show appreciation to them and let them know that even though I'm reordering online or on the phone, it's still me at the end of the day. So it's such a good feeling going back to my, exactly, relationships are key. Going back to my vendors and them saying hi to me and hugging me and just through the years of being with them. But at the end of the day, really, my, my customers are the ones that are benefiting because I'm extending that price. And they give me first dibs on products. So it's... One thing I did, and again, I don't know the industry well, but you don't buy a lot of any one thing. You buy very small quantities and you almost create that sense of scarcity in the sense that Stuff goes up on your, was it every Thursday you every post? Every Thursday, yeah. They post a new set of fashions on Facebook, and it's like a race it's because crazy. they only have a few, and if you're common size, you better get down there and get it because it's going to be gone. There's no more coming, it's and I think crazy. that's kind of interesting. It's that Because we're value. so used to, well, we're so used to walking into a store, a large store, and there's 600 of something. Or right. seeing something on the sidewalk with somebody wearing. If you go to a special occasion or a there's wedding. There's three of you. You go to, <laughs> you go to Express, where else do you go? Um, it's that's a good problem to have, yeah. but we've also at the front end of retail, we've had to, I've had women come into my store and tell me they're going to put me out of business. Do you know why am I putting, because I wouldn't sell them a shirt. It would be Tuesday and we're steaming it, getting it ready for Thursday. And I say, well, it will go out Thursday. You can buy it then. I'm going to put you out of business. So it's just <laughs> like, okay. I mean, it's just, it's it's really crazy. It, it's when you're small You have good business. stories about bad customers. <laughs> yes, I like Do you, do you want to tell right. bad customer <laughs> stories today? No, I don't, but I mean one customer brought in a shirt and at, right after St. Patrick's Day and it was green and it had really odd looking beer and food stains and makeup stains all over, but she didn't wear it and it was like $25 and she demanded that it goes back on her credit card. And we don't even refund credit cards, we give you store credit within seven days. And she de she swore she didn't wear it and I, I look at her receipt, pull her up on Facebook with her standing there and it's her profile picture. At least take down your profile picture <laughs> in the shirt if you're, you know. And I obviously, legally, I can't say, wait, this is this you? Because I can't look at her up on Facebook, but I'm just, I've learned along the days, don't believe everything you hear. Cause uh -oh. <laughs> if there's a suspicious stain on it, it's probably been so. <laughs> so just along those lines, from the car business, you guys know how the car dealers finish below lawyers, right? So there was a book when I was a young man growing up in the car business. It was that the, all the car people loved. It was written by a car salesman. It was called "Buyers Are Liars Too," <laughs> and it was 200 pages of all the things these customers had done to the car dealers. So <laughs> there are true stories about bad customers out yeah. there. Yeah, so I you're feel like a great customer. you're turning. Yeah, you do. You're turning this stuff like every four, five, six weeks. It's just totally rolling over the store almost isn't it i mean i'm sure you have a few fundamentals but yeah and normally in a like a box store like a brick and mortar larger store they turn product twice a year three times a year i'm turning it like 24 times i mean and it's see, constant and that's what i think is really interesting about this business model it, to me as a another business person looking at it is you're creating the sense of urgency yes you can't wait yes. Right? You just can't sleep on this. It's, yeah. To me, it's like the rare, again, car guy, it's the rare car. One of those comes up for sale once a year in the nation. If one comes up for sale, you better have your checkbook ready to go because by the time it's in the paper, by the time it's online, it's gone. Right. Uh, and I think that idea of creating this amazing sense of, of scarcity and the idea of don't buy more, don't load up, don't buy a hundred of, of anything. I think that's a, in a world that's kind of mass consumerism gone mad, right. Right? right? That's a really interesting business model to see that work. Well, I don't know if anyone's heard of flash sales, designer flash sales. So you can buy like guilt and I call it hot look, but hot look. My friend who I just saw in LA, he's one of the project managers and he always yells at me. He says, I call it like the Midwestern hot look, but it's hot look. Hot. Uh, hot look. Hot, hot couture. Hot, hot couture. Um, yeah. and you can't say it right. You're not part of the clip. <laughs> I guess not. It's a club. Uh, <laughs> well, I've spent a lot of money on there because at 11 o'clock guilt, 
rolls out their designer sales. So I could buy a Kate Spade handbag for a fraction of the price. That sense of urgency is constantly trickling down on me. Um, and that goes for men too. I know I have a lot of guy friends that log in at the same time mm -hmm. to buy men's clothing at a fraction of the price. Well, and when I was in LA this weekend and we met for dinner, he was telling me that he had to send a cease and desist letter to a boutique because they had bought, the, they had a big Rolex sale and they had bought Rolexes at a, at a fraction of the price and were selling them in their store and they have a 90 day return. So what they did, weren't selling to their consumer, they were returning. They were flipping. Yes. So, they were floating the inventory. Yes. So nice. There yeah. is a lot, I mean, there's such a demand for that right now. And I do want to say the sense of urgency is really high, but I didn't go in my business plan. I didn't create that as a model to do. It's just the quantities that I buy from the manufacturers are small. When I get in a product, let's say I get this shirt in and I love it so much and I call them immediately to reorder it because I know it's going to be a big right. hit. If my manager wants it, my model wants it, chances are my customer. I'll call my vendor that day and they're already sold out too. So my sense right. of urgency through them is just as high. So it's kind of like a ball game. But what an interesting matchup that you're using vendors that can't just go, sure, I'll send you another thousand. Yeah. And, but yet what is, it's not a negative. So many exactly. times what you see as a negative on the back side of your business, you assume is a negative on the front side of your business. Like, well, maybe it's not. Yes. Maybe it's not a negative. Hey, let's open it up for a few questions, see what people want to ask you. Shall be we do nice. that? <laughs> yeah, be kind. She's nervous. I, yeah. I can't tell you how nervous she is. Yes. So I have a question about how you make the decision or are making the decision around distribution um, and to open this distribution channel for your customers. Like, how do you make that facility that I can control versus sure. having somebody else do that fulfillment for you. Did you go through a process of looking at? That's a good question. No, and I do it myself. And that's in the flip side, that's not the way I would say to go because when you are at the position you are at this point, you need to reallocate some of those roles. You need to outsource some of that stuff. Right. So, you know, I even talked to Mike about that, about getting a space downtown and having somebody else micromanage it for me, and that will alleviate it. But because of my unique background and doing website management and seeing their distribution channels, I just decided to start small with a 4,000 square foot warehouse, which seems big now. Small. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just to apply what I have learned in the past and then to start outsourcing local operations manager and everything like that. But again, kind of the recipe for my success has been small quantities. So even though I'm turning product, there's still small enough quantities where I'm not sitting on a lot of product. So that's kind of the vision is to just keep it moving. So you're going to hear the word turns constantly at anything physical goods. and you, In the first six months, you're going to learn to hate the word. Yeah. <laughs> then you're going to learn to understand that it's the oxygen in your body. Without turns, you die. Exactly. Because the cash coming back, yeah. it's dead inventory, it's having to take a deep discount to get rid of something. And, and to that alternative, I would tell you, and there's many of us in town, uh, I don't know if Kip's in here right now, I saw him earlier today, that are doing all of our, our fulfillment on Amazon simply because it is so amazingly efficient. I have a product I sell retail for $35.95 on Amazon. I never see it. And I get $27.55 every time one sells. And they market Keep, it for you. And by the way, shipping, they take care of it. They market it. They take the credit card. They take the return. They put up with the customers. They have the warehouse. They, I don't do anything. And so when you start, you have to really force yourself to look at the alternatives. And if you didn't have all that experience, I would have been like, don't do it yourself. Exactly. So. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's back to cost. Right now, I've outgrown my back stock rooms. And he had a great analysis. If you want to see the, the real guts of a retail, go into the back room and see how chaotic it is. Because that's real life. If you go into Gap right now, you're not going to be thinking pretty. In, There's you know, things fun. falling on your head oh, from God, shells. Yes. There's shells falling off the walls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like in my store. Um, so I forgot where I was going that's with that. That's right. But, We're um, talking about distribution centers. Yeah. So my, I've already ran out of space in my stores to backstock this merchandise anyways. So at the end of the day, I plug numbers. The rate I got this warehouse space, it I could pay for it and not lose sleep based on my stores. Is that ideal? No, but at some point, until it starts making money on its own, I'm utilizing that storage space to backstop product for my store. So it kind of, it's a give and take, push and pull a little bit. Yeah, Curtis. You talked about the importance of buying product that's made in the USA. Really yes. interested in what's behind it. Is it 
Um, you answer that, then I'm going to answer it too. Yeah. I got to get it on this conference because I'm in the same boat. It, for me, it's because it, the turnaround is quicker. That they're employing people in the United States and they're employing designers that understand the market a little bit more. So for me, it, it just makes sense and it's a quicker rate. Um, the industry that I'm buying out from the manufacturers, that industry, like I was saying, took off really in 2005 when the economy they started. Uh, what, what essentially happened are a lot of the higher end price points were ordering less. So the manufacturers were starting to employ designer, in-house designers for a fraction of the price and putting out merchandise that's cheaper to buyers like me. I couldn't afford to, to price $300 in my, uh, an item in my store, but I can't afford $30 or $40. So then literally out of night that started getting huge. So those manufacturers started buying warehouse space and they started making it, hiring pattern makers in downtown LA. So that creates such a shift in the economy in that industry now. Um, and for me, I'm ad identifying better with the designers, if that makes sense. So I would add to that the computerization that's gone into the fashion industry in the last 15 years of from uh, anything from cutting to pattern making to you know a lot of the, the raw costs of a single design, the cost to design something has shrunk and the time to design has shrunk, and the utilization, how well you utilize your raw fabric has shrunk. Absolutely, if, so if supply I, and demand, if, it's a trickle down theory. If the consumer is buying less due to the economy, yeah. then the store is going to be buying less, then the manufacturer is going to be selling less. So really, there, it's a genius idea, and I just happened to kind of, that, that yeah. boss that called me for the buying job, just it just happened to be perfect. Yeah. I think the other thing people don't think about is if you're going to buy from China, so the manufacturer I use has US operations and Chinese operations because they get orders from Disney for literally 800,000 items, okay? And they buy them six months in advance by the container load. And if you can do that and you have the cash to pay for it, that's great. It. But the cost of just owning the inventory, the interest on all that stuff. Uh, my manufacturer sits in Cicero, Illinois, and they employ people at 15 bucks an hour. I like that, uh, or better. And they're very talented at what they do. You have to, we all know this, the fabrics don't come from the US. There's not a lot of fabric made here, but the, the actual making of the, of the item, I do think people care about it. Uh, I very much marketed, not made in USA, but made in Chicago on my product, just to be a little edgy. Mm -hmm. And I literally will get things, there's stuff on my Amazon page that says, why is this so expensive? So because the people who make it live in the US and get paid a reasonable wage. Like, cool, that. and they buy the item. So exactly. it does work. It doesn't work for everybody, but I don't really want the customer that's buying the cheapest thing. Go buy a Yugo, you know? I'm sorry. Yeah, Just absolutely. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've dealt with this a lot. Did you go to Guangzhou, or were you dealing with tangible items, if you don't mind? Okay. So, and not to interrupt your question to me, but I used to travel to Guangzhou, the factories in China, and I would stay there for four weeks at a time. And Ooh. I was telling him, really identifying with that lifestyle and coming back to U.S. soil made me more passionate about creating job opportunities here. Um, they, it's really a hidden industry. I know a lot of people have tried to make surface it, slaves and factories and workers and everything like that, but it still is a huge problem. When these young kids are living at the factories right. all year round in the country or in, in at the factories and then they go back to the country one time a year during Chinese New Year. And that is just a devastating real life, realistic approach to it. So if you if you're interested in selling a tangible item, I would absolutely say you would have a, a push on American made and that kind of emotional, you know what I mean? It, it, when you're selling it to identify with the consumer emotionally saying this is made in the US, I would buy it even if it was two thirds more, I would say, I would. So now how do you grow it? The expansion process. Where's the cloning of Rebecca going to happen? <laughs> when will it be five know, of right? you? Right. Um, and I was joking to him, good thing I'm crazy cat lady, because it really, I really have abandoned a lot of 
personal things too and lost out on a lot of relationships and, and opportunities, you know, because I live, eat, and breathe this. Um, I am in the expansion process now. I haven't made it. I'm not sitting back with my feet up, racking in money. It is still, a, I'm a startup at the end of the day and I'm in four years of business. Um, I am trying to find management right now. I'm, tr I'm looking for coders, so if anybody knows anybody. We already introduced her to Levi, everybody. So. <laughs> um, I'm taking it day by day in that realistic approach, just like I was telling her. The warehouse that I'm paying rent on now, I'm taking out of the sales from my stores, but it's realistic. It makes sense right now. So I'm slowly growing into it. Uh, in six months, I hope to house an in-house photographer, developer, maybe that's more down the, the, a year down the line. But right now, I'm just kind of starting slow. I have my beta site up right now, so you can shop on it, but it's not a finalized version. I'm looking to do that. Um, I would love to outsource a lot of these things that I'm currently overseeing. Right now, I do everything myself. The buying, the product allocation to both stores, the managing, the payroll, the bookkeeping, the photo shoots every week, twice we, a week. We got to get you to outsource yeah. things. Yeah. So, yeah. at some point, I might flip out. <laughs> so Rebecca, yeah. is part of that uh, that control because you know so much, and that yes. probably is something that many entrepreneurs grapple with. Yes. yes, it is. I've slowly started to let go. I'm never in the stores during time during store hours, which is. I used to run the stores myself too. I think the first year I moved here, I ran the dam to dam. Then I opened the store and was there <laughs> until yeah, seven did. at night. I'm just like, I guess I'm crazy a little bit. But um, now I'm starting to like kind of push those responsibilities for the stores. But as, when it comes to photo shoots and styling, that's what I spent so many years in the industry doing. And that's my passion and my recipe. So on our Facebook page, we put looks together every week, and a lot of women come in for those full looks and. And our expertise. So, you know, I, I, I can't let that go yet. I've tried. I've tried to outsource responsibilities to managers, but then they'll put, like, hot pink spandex pants. <laughs> yeah, we were doing hot pink spandex yesterday. So. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Nope. <laughs> What's... This more than a question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you are, Clement. Yes. <laughs> Remember, you are not Wonder Woman. You're not yeah. Wonder Woman. <laughs> 20 here, 30 days, you get things out of your way. Yeah. So until you have Yeah. My doctor Wonder said Woman. that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're not so, going to ask which kind of doctor. Until I drop down. <laughs> we got a question over here. So, I, mean, I think you hit it on the you know, nail on the head, though. I mean, your core competency is putting that book together, and yeah. people are going to come in for that book. So get rid of the payroll, get rid of that stuff, get yeah. rid of the structure. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's for your book. Yeah. You know, close your mind. Yeah. Really my question, yeah. just came up. The question <laughs> was, um, or I guess your point, you know, um, now with the website coming up, um, that it made it has, you know, how can we work on this book? Absolutely. I will tell you, number one, that's my downfall. And that's probably going to hurt me because the list building, the, the charts and everything like that. I am, I think I kind of flipped, went under the rug and test, didn't test for ADHD or ADD, but I think I battled that all the time because I'm very, like, I get sidetracked. And I think visually that's why I'm so successful at putting the looks together and the store and everything because I'm constantly moving around. But when it comes to lists and tedious things like that, that is my downfall and I think that I don't want to make myself look bad, but yeah. That's that's this building, I need your email list building. Like, I mean, oh, like, sorry. The, no, I'm okay. Like on the marketing side, like your list building of, you know, who are you going to market to when you have those? Absolutely. Um, Facebook being a good driver, I think that's not going to be the. I think mean, that's great for local, but it's not. Gonna Absolutely. Plus, uh, that brings a whole other point: is not competing directly with my brick and mortar store because let's face it, brick and mortar is a lot more, you know lot more overhead and a lot more expensive than a housing a product and a website for a fraction of the price. Um, I am trying to outsource somebody for the website to do that, but right now the platform I'm using there enables the consumer to come in and do the email blast and everything. I'm doing MailChimp too, but right now, going back to my list billing when I misunderstood you, th those are the lists that I'm creating of what I need to do before we fully launch. So we're that's why I keep saying the beta testing. We're still getting orders daily. 
are they at where we want? Absolutely not, but we're, it's kind of like a homemade site right now. We're just kind of winging it, but absolutely that's something that forecasting it out six months, three months, a year to be able to market. So when I'm meeting with these other third party companies that will do it for me, creating content for the website, creating, you know, um, it's hard though because my price points are so disposable. We're not a sales store. People don't come in for sales. They come in for what's new. So a lot of the websites offer the free shipping or 10% off. But, you know, we don't want to devalue our product. We really want to target the people that are coming in for the new merchandise, the pre-orders and things like that. So I'm working a little bit with the content builder on how that we can market our existing customers but also target the new mark, if that answers your question. Okay. <laughs> All right, we've got one waiting back here that we're gonna go over here and I'm sure I'm missing others. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, r really, I just want to say I came in at the right time and offered a, uh, the right product at the right time at the right cost. Honestly, I didn't have money to market it at the time. Um, if you've been to my downtown store, I know you've been to the West Coast. I remember meeting with you, but if you've been to my downtown store, you know it was off the beaten path. It at some point didn't even have correct, like legit signage, so it's just kind of like walking into somebody's front living room, which is where my store was, was in the living room space of the loft. Um, so when you're starting a business or off running a business, believing in your product and offering something that is, you know, an honest, genuine product and not inflated. You know, I didn't sell the product for $80. I knew that there was no competition. I could have inflated the prices, but I was very realistic with my approach and catering to women just like me that couldn't afford the higher. I will say one of the things she did that I saw was a lot of people referred people to her. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this? Have so you word of, To answer your question, Total word a word of mouth. Route, word of mouth. And in fact, I was going back to LA every three weeks at that point and, or every four weeks. And I literally was bringing suitcases. And at this point, it was so small, I was stuffing product in the plastic bags from my manufacturers in there. And women with my top buyers at that point would come in and meet me, literally some offered to meet me at the airport. I mean, it was just crazy to go. I would go Talk into my store open. Customers. Yeah, and it, to show you how unglamorous it was, I was open six days a week at this point. I would fly out on the one day I wasn't open. I was I employed myself. I'd fly out myself, take the red, do my buying, take the red eye back and open the store. I literally at one point was I couldn't do it. Anymore. Your mom was trying to yeah, get you I to was slow down on I think I did go to the hospital at that point from dehydration or whatever, but the the point is it was um, word of mouth. People were coming in. It was that in like I want I even joke like it was like drug trafficking for women, like clothing. It was just crazy how <laughs> Yeah. You had a question here. Yeah, Rebecca, my question is on the marketing side of things. We're doing a lot with Facebook. Facebook has been still our number one outlet for social media marketing. Um, we are on Instagram and this is something that forecasting down the line, I would love to employ somebody to do that, whether it's a third party comp company or a manager that has social media marketing skills that can that can just do it. Right now I'm doing it all myself. So on top of the styling and the looks, I'm posting the pictures, I'm doing it on Instagram. We have 12 or 1300 followers on, on Instagram, so and the broad spectrum of things, it's not a lot, but on the small part of being a small business owner, I'm doing as I'm still trying to keep up with our demand. So until I reach that point where we need the, you know, the business and really to stretch ourselves out in marketing, I'm just kind of going winging it right now. But when we do the website, absolutely, that will be a full-time in-house position for someone. Is the marketing? Hopefully. <laughs> at the back. Um, how do you forecast the next fashion trend? Is it your own formula that you have, or is it that? And that's a great question. Um, when I was trend forecasting for a large business, I had access to the portals of um, London and, and st styles from all over from a year out. We, um, Pantone, which is the color, 
they do trend forecasting. I was going to multiple shows yearly all over the country internationally when I was employed. That was, you know, trend forecasting. And the crazy thing is I was employed by a, a company in Los Angeles, but a lot of their consumers were based out of the Midwest. So we were flying to Chicago and doing trend forecasting. A lot of it's that trickle up theory where designers are going to the consumer looking for inspiration. So a lot of designers fly in from London and will go to a Chicago um, coffee shop and sit and see what the consumers are wearing in the Midwest because that's their market base. But fast forward four years to my business, it's a 50-50, you know, I bring the hot pink spandex pants up. They, Pantone could you tell me hot those pink. up. <laughs> <laughs> First thing that comes to mind. Um, and I was just asked this question a couple days ago, but it, realistically, if somebody's going to tell me that hot pink spandex pants are in, I'm not going to supply that because I know that my customer in Iowa is not going to wear that. So it's a lot of forecasting and knowledge, but also realistically that pull from the Des Moines community are they really gonna buy that? So understanding your target market is number one. You know, Mark, you you can blindly put stock stuff based on what people tell you are in trend or on trend, but unless it's gonna sell, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I'm a small business owner and I need to sell stuff. You don't get to send it back. <laughs> no, no. no. Yeah. yeah. Let's come up with the name, one, and two, if we're still in LA, what would you be doing now? <laughs> That's a good question. Ooh, Living good question. night, and, if I was still in LA, I would, absolutely still be living paycheck to paycheck. I, I spent the night with one of my best friends um, who I worked in the industry and at, she's a fashion buyer now and she works in PR too. Um, at the same company I got her the job for six years ago. So it's, real, it's a bittersweet feeling going back and seeing her. But going back this time, she has a studio apartment in Koreatown in the hip trendy part of downtown LA. And she's paying $1,500 a month and it's just, really a raw fact that if you're living in a big city and you're working in the industry, it's not glamorous at the end of the day. Um, the name comes, Mint is not really based on the color, which a lot of people think it is. I just thought of clean, gender neutral in case I want, fresh, clean, and gender neutral in case I want to eventually sell men's clothes on the website. Um, and I thought it was classic and timeless. And um, I had, literally two weeks to come up with the name when I won the contest. I had two, I was like, what's the fastest name? So in the marketing spectrum, when I wanted to start it, I wanted to give mint, little tins of mint out with my name and logo and the address on it. So everything came back, it just kind of came full circle. And um, the funny thing is in 2011, when I started, mint was the on-trend color for the next three seasons. So. It, everything just kind of fell in place. A little luck works out yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> uh, maybe the biggest failure or uh, competition now that's frustrating? Um, I don't want to dwell on failures. I don't know if I would say I have any failures. I do everything very, very realistically. Um, I didn't grow up on a personal level. I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I knew when I moved to California that it was do or die, basically, is what I say. My parents didn't have the luxury of offering me a, a, an education, so um, I put myself through school, and I, I kind of used that mentality forward. With every job, I applied 100%, and with my company, I apply 100%, because I, I can't allow to fall back on the what ifs. So, I don't want to say I have a lot of failures because I do everything very small. I test product very small. I, I have a very realistic approach. I might love something and think that it's going to sell, but I still stock very small quantities because I don't want to sit on it. It's just that what if. Um, what was, sorry, what was the second question? Uh, maybe competition that you see within the field. I mean, you talked about, I think most retailers see Amazon as this evil, right? You probably sort of identify the evil in that see yeah. it as that. The great thing is women all over the world shop all the time. When they're at work on a Monday, they're shopping. When they're at home with a glass of wine, they're shopping. So no matter how many competitors there are online, there's always somebody shopping. Now on a local, you know, local level, there I can be replaced anytime. Just because I am the first to come to town and offer it, my biggest problem has been competitors stealing brands. I've had so many women come into my store that are just housewives that they're, they are bored and their husband makes money and they want, think that 
it's glamorous. It's not glamorous. So they like take my brand, they go online, they call my showrooms and they start a company. I can't tell you how many women I've had to do a cease and desist or a trespassing because they're not customers anymore. They're actually trespassing. Um, Is your vendor protect you on that? I'm sorry? Is your vendor protect you on that? Nope, Zip because I'm buying from the manufacturer. Oh. So back to where if you were back before 2005, they would. They wouldn't sell within a certain radius. Now it's, it would be like you coming into my store and being like, I don't like that person, don't sell to her. Well, I'm sorry, I can't, you know what I mean? So um, that's been my biggest hurdle is protecting my assets because I have a product that everybody wants apparently, but so do the competitors. And there are right now a couple stores that sell my brands that they stole that were my customers. And at first I was like, oh, I'm so upset, but I just kind of let things happen naturally, you know, if, if you're chasing constantly and you're constantly stealing from somebody, chances are you're just constantly a step behind. And I've also done things to protect my assets. I do private label now, so a lot of my brands say mint, and that's to protect myself. I have to pay more and I don't inflate the product. I just, out of peace of mind, to know that they're gonna come into my store to steal that, it's, you know. But moving forward, there's always organically, as far as the economy is growing, more larger retailers are going to come to this community. Des Moines been in Forbes so many times. What do you think that means for the retailers? You know, anthropology is coming to town, urban outfitters. Um, there's going to be so many retailers in the next five years. Hell, REI is coming to town. They don't have that many stores. Yeah, it's, it's That's crazy. Not a lot. There's yeah. not a lot of REI stores in the no, United States. No, it's crazy. And, and some of those aren't directly competitors, but no, some but of them are. No, but it just says how much the scene is on. Exa I mean, absolutely. And so that's kind of the direction I'm going for is to, one, not not avoid and not um, forget about my brick and mortar stores, but also create a platform online so that it kind of level balances it. We got a question. Speaking of online competition, how do you feel about Stitch Fix? Um, the, is that where they ship you packages from other things? Um, ship you five on whatever your schedule is. They yeah, I think. I don't know too much about it, but I think anything like that is awesome. You know what I mean? Like it's. Um, Somebody had a, some woman or whoever created that company had a vision, and they're trying to they're trying to supply women just like. Darian. I'll tell you because Dairy and Boz is doing the same thing with Men's Style Lab, and it's yeah. such a different customer. So the yeah. Stitch Fix customer a lot of times is the woman who is in her internship as a doctor, saying, "Send me a yeah. box of clothes." Yeah. I don't care. Right, and my consumer is End of more, discussion. She knows what she wants, and she totally different customer. Right. So, uh, and that's kind of with my stores too. Um, the a lot of the girls come in and they know what they want, and we've just it's been help. You know, if you're easy. watching trends at all, I mean, there's actually some talk now. You have uh, there's been men like me who've worn a quote unquote uniform for years. I only wear black pants. I only have four colors of shirts. Most of them are black. Okay, because of the fact it just eliminates the hassle of my life. There are women out doing that. There was an article in Entrepreneur or Inc. about a lady who wears a uniform every day. And it was like the most freeing thing for her. There are some people who are going to go a different direction. Markets change. And if you are someone, I, I think women have a lot of pressure to be in fashion, whether they give a shit about it or not. And for some, they're finally going, you know what? I don't care. I just want to wear something that I cannot worry about. Yeah. My boss was a sales director and she was that kind of person. It had no interest for her. And she literally hired somebody in a store to buy clothes for her because she just did not want to deal with it. So just, I want to look like yeah. this. So I think there's, I think markets are, are separating. I think that's where big boxes get in trouble is you can't satisfy everybody in the same store. Exactly. It, one last question, then we got to wrap it up. All right, well, I'm going to take the floor on one last thing though. Oh, one last question. Go for it, Bernard. What's your tattoo mean? All right. Oh my God. And we've we got to talk about the cat yet. So. <laughs> well, it has nothing to do with my cat. This means pure and um, in Mandarin. Um, I used to speak a little Cantonese and Mandarin and Korean now because um, I deal with primary Korean. But it just it was. I got it when I was 18 and moved to California. It means not, none of my tattoos mean anything besides Midwestern girl going to a big city and becoming <laughs> culture shocked. Um, but it just it meant Good answer. it was pure pure at heart. Meaning I I try to remember the pure at heart is something that I like to think I am. But cool. <laughs> Rebecca, don't cut me off in traffic. And, no, <laughs> just kidding. I gotta okay. say this has been about one of the most fun ones of these we've had in a long, long time. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Give her a hand. Thank you.